Pops, Ed. Yeah, no idea, man. Pops need to Pops need to pay his bills. Yo. Yo, I don't see you, bro. How can't you see? What's going on? What do you mean you can't see me? Oh, there you are. Yo, you need to. Oh, you changed. This is what it is. You changed location. <laughs> but I'm, I'm inside today, man. I'm inside, bro. Bro, you listen. I'm I'm sweating, bro. I, I had like, what what I had five. Bro, five I minutes. joined already. If you knew what these last ten minutes were like for me, so we spoke. I decided, you know, I'm gonna cut my hair because I'm looking crazy, and my my clippers just just stored on me. So you were late. So I was. I wasn't I was, late. No, I was here at three o'clock, but I was um, but I was cutting my hair, and it just stopped working. So I don't even know what's going on back here right now because I, I look crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. but listen though, everything, everything for the last three episodes, the connection has been fine. Everything is fine. The only thing that changed is your location. What's wrong but, with that? See what I mean? See, see what's what's going on here today? Yeah, I'm trying to get the perfect setup. Bro. Allow me, allow me, allow me. Allow me. <laughs> nah, it's cool, man. People are coming on. I was trying to. I told Matthew, I'm getting better with this, man. You know, I could actually see who's coming on and talk at the same time. You know, before Wait, I how did you couldn't do that the first time? No, nah, man. You meant this but, saying I was on Ghana time. I was here at 3 o'clock. It just wasn't connected. Nah, bro. Everyone was on. <laughs> Whoever came on at 3 o'clock know who came late, bro. I was here. I hear you talking about this is not my fault and everything. I was connected. It wasn't my fault, bro. You would never admit that you're late. <laughs> no, no, I wasn't late. I mean, I was... Okay, you know what? In the... um. Everyone is witness right now. This is the first time you're going to be late. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm going to be the first time. First of all, I'm very professional when it comes to that. Okay. I was late. I'm not even going to tell you why, because I because it's going to sound like an excuse, but I was late. That's it. That's 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 it. I mean, we're good. It's, it's no it's no big deal. Listen, this is this is what I always say. Professionally, you're probably never ever been late. With your boys, you probably always oh. late. <laughs> yeah, the, with my boys, they like I'm the one that's always late. Professionally, I'm 15 minutes early. I ain't got time for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, but um, let's. So, episode four today, right? I was uh, I was telling you earlier how I'm getting better at this. I'm, uh, you know, not only can I read who's coming online and talk at the same time, like I can tell you right now, you know, who's asking questions and talk at the same time. Before, so what have you been doing the last three episodes? Then I don't understand. Because this is new to me. Most of the time, when you talk to someone, you look at them, right? So I was looking at you while I'm talking to you directly, but but I realized, you know, I could do that and look down there, see who's saying what. You know what I mean? So I see. You know, so, but anyway, so I don't want to uh, take too much time. So I want to get into today. We want to talk obviously about being a pro and making it to, to a professional level. You know, obviously you and I had, uh, we, we came from similar background, obviously with our path, but our process and our way to, to becoming pros were very different. Um, and I think that's a lot of, you know, a lot of people could relate to both, but there's also a lot of information we could share in terms of, you know, the things that we deal with, uh, being pro athletes, but also the life change, the life changing stuff that we deal with. So, you know, starting with you, I just want you to talk about just, we, we could go from, you know, now it's your senior year and it's time to leave, you know, it's time to become a pro. So that process and also becoming a pro, you know? Man, yeah, that's that's a great way to start. I think, you know, for me, I remember I referenced uh, last time a conversation that we had my junior year. I found out that I was, you know, going to enter the draft. And this was just a new place for me. And I remember you came in town. I think you probably played the Wizards or something. And we caught up and had dinner or lunch. Uh, and I just remember asking you what you thought. And to be honest with you, I was just excited to be able to, to be to be able to have that conversation because prior to that, our experiences had been so 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 different that yes, we played the same sport, but it was our paths had been different. So I couldn't really reference to you the NBA lifestyle and what was going on there. I could listen and you know and and listen to and receive everything you're saying, but for the first time in a long time, I felt like I had arrived to be able to have a conversation with my boy and be like, look, I have an opportunity to go to the league this year. What do you think? And I remember you telling me, you got to jump in with both feet. Whatever decision that you make, 
do it with both feet. And I never forgot that, that conversation. And when it came to making my decision, I was like, I'm going to go back to school. Because uh, I remember working out for about 20 NBA teams and thinking to myself, like, yeah, I can do this. But uh, the, the feedback that I got that I wasn't fully ready. And I wanted to be a first-round pick. You know, my, my, one of my biggest goals that I set, and mind you, I had accomplished most of the goals that I set for myself um, up until this point. And so for me, getting drafted, coming from Tottenham, playing for, for, for Hackney White Heat and, and playing for Joe, to see me not even walk across that stage, but to see me just get drafted and have my name called, I felt like it would go so much further with the younger generation of African and kids from London um, or England in general if they were to see that happen. Because I remember how inspiring it was for me to see you get get um, drafted, um, you know, during your process. And so that's what I wanted. And I remember the quick story. I remember saying, not going to have a draft party. Not going to have a draft party. Um, I just want to have something with my family. Um, and close friends are just going to be there to experience this moment with me because, you know, it's never happened before. You know, you know, we never knew that it would come to this. And a friend of mine owned a club in D.C. And I remember asking him if I could just use the space for like 10 people. He said, yeah, no problem. By the time it was two hours before the draft, it was like 40 people. And it turned into a party. And man i was just sitting there in the back of my mind like man i really hope this doesn't go the way i think it does and i wasn't thinking negatively but i remember the year before when a couple of my friends who stayed in the draft they had actual parties and they never and they never they didn't get drafted so i never wanted to get ahead of myself and and do that but um i had all these family and friends who wanted to be um a part of this so we did it and ended up being a party so we go through the first round. I don't hear my name called. You know, my my agent at the time told me and was like, you know, there's a chance you can get drafted in the first round. There's a chance that you won't. So I first name first round, my name doesn't get called. Then um, second round comes. I'm starting to anticipate 30s, mid 40s, nothing, 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 nothing. And it gets down to the 60th pick. And they say from George Washington, and everybody in the room is like, Whew, finally. And they said my teammate's name. Yo, man, when I tell, I remember my brother Cole just getting up and leaving. He just walked, he just left. Yeah. And I was like, and I was just sitting there and I was like, well, how do I save face and how do I still be professional for all these people who came to support me? But they came to support me and I didn't get drafted. So I felt like I had failed. And I remember my mom called me, and I never forgot it. And it's literally one of the motivating factors uh, for me to up being in the NBA after the fact. She told me she didn't know what happened. You know, my parents had only seen me play once or twice, so they didn't know what was going on. And my mom told me she wept. She was like, I wept. I didn't know what happened. I thought something went wrong. Why didn't they call your name? What, like, we watched it. They, they watched it on, um, on the Internet. My mom had to know nothing about basketball, and I'm ex I explained this whole process to them, and they got excited about it. And then they asked me um, what happened. I didn't get drafted. I didn't know how to explain it. I didn't know what to tell them. I felt like I had failed them. Um, and as soon as my mom said she wept, I felt sorry for myself for about another hour. And then after that, I was like, I got a call from the Mavericks. And I told myself from that day forward to, to focus on one thing, and that was rebounding. And I told myself, no man is ever going to be able to box me out. And fortunately, I was able to sign with the Mavericks out of Summer League, which doesn't happen too often. And, um, yeah, that was the start of my NBA career and how it came about. Was, uh, at the time when you when you signed with the Mavericks, was Emma with uh, Amadou yep. with the Mavericks? Uh, and, yeah. I'm, uh, and I'm pretty sure he had something to do with it. And listen, try, try everything. Yeah, I tell people often that, you know, Amadou was probably the main reason uh, that I was ever in the NBA. My junior year, I know there was a couple of teams that wanted me to stay. Obviously, Mavericks were one of them. Um, you know, I like to credit that to, to you know, my mentor and, you know, great friend in uh, Amadou. Um, so, yeah, he definitely has played a part into it. Yeah. Now, for those, for those who don't know Amadou, Amadou is pretty much 
a big brother to us. Um, he's, you know, the president of Bao Basketball Africa League, but also the we, we call him the godfather of African basketball. Um, and the reason is, is he put so many people on and he's been doing it for so long. So shout out to Amadou, man. I don't, I don't know where he's at. I think he's in South Africa right now, but... You know, for all, for, for all the all the hard work that he's doing, man, trying to trying to put you know uh, African basketball on the map, and obviously you and I are part of that, but it's something we're going to talk about later. Um, so for me, I want to talk a little bit, you know, for people that don't know uh, my my coming to the league and how it all happened. So obviously last last time i talked about the drive from you know uh jersey which my friend corrected me it was pennsylvania uh muhlenberg uh so we drove from there all the way to north carolina and that's when i made up my mind within that drive that i'm leaving and i gave the news to coach k to duke when i got there um and everything changed from there um obviously i was uh this was like right after the final four uh, so we had more time in school, but I shifted my whole focus to, you know, working out and getting ready for the draft. Um, and for me, I was projected to go top three, uh, you know, and I was basically a year before that, like I said, I was, you know, going to go, I think I was told I would go like around the 20th uh, from high school. Uh, so th this is what I was told. So. For me, I was like, you know what, I could go to college and get, you know, uh, get higher in the draft. Uh, <laughs> so, so what's that, bro? I'm sorry, that, that the dog, the, I know you changed location because of the dog, but... No, nah, <laughs> no, nah, I'm, I'm laughing at uh, what Stan just wrote. Yo, Stan is a clown, man. This guy. <laughs> I'm gone. Yo, so I, I know I, I mentioned the dog just... Uh, I got a lot of uh, messages about the iguana the the other day. So just just to let people know, I called a uh, pet control, animal uh, animal care, or whatever they called, right? And uh, my man came to catch the iguanas, and I told him the story. You know, I said the iguanas have been after me. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm doing my live, and they're showing up on my window. You know, so I had to let him know what's going on. So he told me, listen. Uh, between, because I told him it's four iguanas. I was like, I see four of them. I could tell you what they look like. There's four of them, and he sat me down and he said, "Look, I'm gonna be honest with you. It's not four iguanas. Between your house and the three houses next to you, there's probably about forty iguanas. Please. So the best thing to do is buy this thing that keeps them away, uh, instead of just trying to waste your energy and trying to catch them. So for everyone who sent me the messages worrying about the iguanas, they're safe. Uh, I'm sure they're taking care of themselves, but. Anyway, let me get back. I don't want to get too much out of the... <laughs> That's just for everyone that was worried about the iguanas. But, uh, you know, so for me, so we drive back, and now my, I'm fully committed to, to go into the league, and I'm projected to go top three. Um, I'm focusing on my workouts, you know, trying to get there and everything. So I, I got invited to obviously be in the green room. Uh, and I remember, you know, getting into the green room, I invited... Uh, you know, close friends and family. And honestly, at the time, I didn't, I, I, I really wasn't, I didn't recognize what's happening. I mean, I know I was about to get drafted, but I was just going through the process. Like, you know, let me just get through with it. Let me just get there. I'm not big on making a big scene. I just, I just want to see where I'm going. Um, and during the draft, you start to hear that, you know, so-and-so traded so-and-so to get this pick. So and so, this team is moving up to get so and so. So, with all the movement and everything, you know, my agent told me, "Listen, uh, we're probably not going to be top three anymore." You know, uh, probably because some teams are moving up to try to get certain guys, so teams are kind of scared of what they want to pick. Um, so, being in the green room, my mom and dad are there, and I, I just going through my head is the stories of people sitting in the green room and not getting drafted. I knew I'll get drafted. But I just didn't want to sit for too long. And you just hear the names calling. And I remember Phoenix Suns. Um, no, I actually, I remember Atlanta had the sixth pick. And what happened earlier was I never went to work out for Atlanta. Uh, I did all my workout pretty much for the top five teams. 
Um, and, and Atlanta asked me to come work out. And I said, yo, you guys come to Chicago. Uh, because at that time, yeah, man, at that time I was in Chicago working out. And I know it's messed up, but, you know, I was... No, 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 that's levels, fam. That's No, nah, but I was working out. I was working out for so many teams. They were coming to see me during my workouts. I went to, to, to five teams, the top five teams. So then Atlanta, with the sixth pick, they, they told my agent, like, yo, he ain't want to work out for us. We ain't picking him. So, and, and that really? was cool. Yeah, and at the time I was like... I'm sitting there, I'm like, man, I should have just went to Atlanta. What, 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 was, what, was I, what was I thinking? I should have just went to Atlanta, man. So anyway, so with the seventh pick, the Phoenix Suns draft me. Um, and the coolest thing was when I was drafted, my mom and dad were sitting across from me. And mind you, my mom hasn't seen me play basketball yet. My dad has seen me play in the Final Four, and here they are in the biggest stage of basketball sitting in the table and uh you, you know i remember very well rest in peace my new ball was with me uh and and we're sitting there and it just took me back to how it all started you know how the whole game going back when i was drafted this is like eight years exactly eight years removed from coming to the u.s as a refugee and eight years from speaking English. And here I am sitting in, in a draft room and about to get drafted. And I remember when I got drafted, I got the video somewhere. My mom got up and started doing the traditional, you know, dance and chat. And as a kid, you know, for me at that time, obviously I've always been proud of, you know, where I come from and everything. But at the time I was like, yo, I was looking at my mom like, yo, they got <laughs> the TVs on, you know? So I just went over and just hugged her. Um, but I was just, at that moment, you know, for me, it was just so much like I've made it, you know, I've made it. My mom and dad, you know, you guys could relax now. My whole family, you could relax. I made it. And right away, I got a call saying that, you know, the, the, the pick has been traded. So I go into the back room and my first interview was, you know, how excited are you to play with Steve Nash and Amari Stoudemire? Um, and me being me, I'm sitting there like, I don't know if they know yet, but I'm just going to go with it. So I'm, yo, so I'm, yo, Steve Nash, man. I can't wait. I can't wait to play with Steve Nash. Amari so dominant, you know? And then I remember at the press conference and I had the Phoenix Suns hat, I got, someone came over and gave me the Bulls hat and said, you know, you've been traded to Chicago Bulls. And I just pivoted, you know, and I just went, yo, Chicago Bulls. I always wanted to play for Chicago <laughs> You know, it's always been a dream of mine. But, you know, that's, that's how it really it started for me. And, and right away sitting there, I just remember I knew, I knew, you know, Chicago Bulls growing up because of Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. Now, what's about to happen next? I had no idea. I was just happy. I'm going to the NBA and I'm just going to be, you know, I'm going to work as hard and be the best I could be. But I, I'm still not, you know, uh, I still haven't come to realization of how big a moment that is at that time. You know, so with that being said, I, I, I want you to talk a little bit about and I'm going to jump into it, too, after you. But I want I want us to talk a little bit about, you know, now that you're a pro, you mm -hmm. know, how 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 has everything changed from college to and I know your path is so different than mine. But now you're a pro, you're, you know, professional. This is your job. You're going to get paid for it. You're going to get treated different than college. What's your approach from there? Man, that is, man, there's so much to unpack with that one. And, um, you know, I think initially we used to talk about um, the process of being a pro and, you know, looking for an agent and, you know, changing your mindset in regards to responsibilities. For me, um, coming from humble, humble beginnings, I was never really high maintenance and I didn't really need a big time agent or an agent that was going to call me every day or something that was going to cater to me. I just needed somebody that was going to put me in a position to thrive and then I was going to take care of the rest. Um, but I wanted somebody transparent and honest because um, I, I see a lot of players um, go through this experience and they, they fire their agents, they, um, they blame their careers on their agents. And I always look at them like, I didn't, your agent wasn't on the court rebounding for you. He wasn't shooting. He wasn't with you shooting in the gym, so <laughs> so 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 why so why is why is he to blame for a lot of that stuff? And, you know, sometimes agents you know can be at fault, but you know if you if you're in the right position, it's up to you. 
it's plain and simple. If I'm on the court, then the rest is up to me. So that's how I looked at it. And I just wanted an agent that was going to be honest with me and tell me the truth. And at the time, it was my older brother's agent. And I just felt like he was the most um, honest and transparent and was going to work hard for me. And again, like I said, I felt like my play on the court had gotten me into this position. And my play on the court was going to keep me there. So agent had nothing to do with it. If he's able to get me workouts, able to get me um, uh, you know, opportunities with teams, then that's then then I got to take care of the rest. So um, you know, going into that experience, that's how I chose my agent. I just you know went for somebody who I could trust and that was honest with me. And that's all I look for. <laughs> um, speaking about my as a pro now, I guess I, we can answer one of these questions because it's relevant. My guy, Stan at African Chop House, asked us, um, you know, what we do with our first check. And for me, it was, I got signed in the summertime from, so it's July. So it was July after the summer league, and I just got signed. And I had a credit union. I remember going to the bank to get, like, $50 to get some money in my pocket to go get some food. I go in there, and there's $30,000 in there. And I'm like, man, what? And mind you, I had I had eighty dollars in there prior to, so there's thirty thousand and eighty dollars in there. And I remember looking, um, looking around, and just taking about thousand dollars out. I went straight to the mall. <laughs> I was like, let me get everything you got in the fifteen. Oh, you ain't got none. Cool. Let me get a fourteen. And then I bought t-shirts. I bought everything. And you know, I remember going through the summer, I got a car and, and stuff like that, and we're just living the life. I had never seen that kind of money before a day in my life. So um, uh, I had to, I didn't know how to handle finances or money or pay bills, like you said. And I remember my agent called me right before the season starts and was like, hey, the team, you know, you're in Dallas, you're in the hotel, now you got to get an apartment. And I asked him, well, how am I going to get an apartment? He was like, the money that, so the $30,000 ended up being my advance from Dallas. I didn't even know they were sending it. I just ran up on it. And he was like, well, use the money you got from Dallas in your advance to pay for your um, apartment. I had about $1,500 left. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how I ran through that <laughs> in one summer. And I'm so glad that my rude awakening and that that negative experience happened to me before I ever bounced upon India because you know this story would have went a lot different had that happened later on in my career so luckily I uh, um you know I made that mistake early and then I started living off of about 30 percent of my salary because I was like this is too much money to to end up being broke at the end of the day so you know I, I know I went a little further but you know tell us about your experience choosing an agent and your first NBA experience and stuff like that. Yeah, man. Um, like I said, it, it's, it's, uh, what you're saying is very similar, man, because, you know, we never had it. Um, you never had that kind of uh, money or that kind of freedom. Uh, for me, my agent, my agent and I were always close. Uh, my agent at the time went to college with my older brother. It's, it's funny how we're so connected to our older brother. Mm -hmm. And how much it helps to have someone, you know, who went through a lot of stuff that, you're, you know, you're going to deal with. Um, so for me, the relationship was already there with, you know, with Josh Knockinson, who was great for me. He was always there for me, but he was more like a friend, uh, more than an agent. So it made things easier. But to take you back, like, for what I'm saying, I try to get people to understand how quick my life changed uh, and how fast everything was happening. You know, like, don't get me wrong, it takes a lot of hard work and you put in a lot of dedication but for me i was telling you earlier pops for me it was lucky because i've always been blessed to find myself in an environment where i was always loved i never felt i never felt like i was around people who didn't want me to su succeed uh, i only felt like i was around people that i couldn't let down um and i kind of you know channeled that kind of put everyone outside except the people that matter uh, so I was listening to the right people. I was working hard. I didn't try to reach too far. I was just in my lane. Uh, so when I got drafted, uh, I never, ever uh, drove a car. Uh, I was drafted without a driver's license. Um, I've never, ever owned a credit card. 
Uh, I don't even, at the time, I didn't know how to put gas in a car. Um, I could count in my, you know, hands how many times I've been in a restaurant to actually order food. So I used to get nervous when I sit down, when I was handed the menu. I used to look at it like, yo, what's, what's all this? And then what, what's this name? And then it turned out it's just chicken and, and, uh, and vegetables. And, you don't, and then it's called some, like, name that you don't even, you can't pronounce. And I used to get nervous when, you know, I was like, yo, I, I don't know what this is. But I used to just point, like, yo, I want this. You know, and then when, when the check came, I'm like, okay, so I give them the credit card, they're going to run it, they're going to come back, I sign. So there's, there was a lot that was so new to me that, that I had to learn, you know what I mean? But going back to the question Stanley asked, um, you know, and I, I'm, not, I'm not even, you know, uh, going to hide this, but when I, first, when I first got drafted, I really, really had no idea how much money I had. Um, I, I I never understood money like that. I just I just wanted success. I didn't know what's in a credit card or what. Uh, so right away, I remember telling my boys we were in New York, and I was like, "Yo, we gotta hit Chinatown. We gotta get those watches." <laughs> yes. <laughs> yo, and it's crazy because I still have some of those watches. And I was oh like, man! Yo. I was like, make "Yo, we gotta hit Chinatown. It. We gotta look fly." And we went to the mall. Until this day, I remember we have the picture too. I bought a South Pole shirt. And now, don't say anything, but I bought, I bought a South Pole shirt. A South Listen, Pole shirt. I, I, we were so hyped, man. We were so hyped because the night before I was drafted, me, my friend Philippe, and Adam were in New York, and we wanted to watch a movie. Um, and we couldn't get in a movie theater because we didn't have enough money, you know. And the next day, we in the draft, and I'm drafted. And, you know, your, your whole world just changes, you know what I mean? But it took me a while uh, to really understand, you know, what I have and how to spend my money. And for the longest, I always tell people this, uh, most of my career, I was always paranoid of going broke. Uh, and, and, you know, there's so many stories that people would tell you from Chicago. I remember my trainer at the time, Fred Tedeschi, uh, we were on the road and we had games and he caught me coming back from Subway. Right. I was every day that we were on the road, my pregame meal was Subway chicken sandwich. Right. And I remember one time Fred. Awful me. pregame meal, by the way. But OK. Huh? Awful pregame meal. No, no. Subway sandwich. Listen, uh, I, listen, man, we might one day get endorsed by uh, Subway. I was once, so, too. I'm, listen, I'm sorry. Subway, I Subway. Back. Listen, Subway I mean, is awful, great. Um, yeah, yeah, Turkey yeah. is better. I <laughs> Turkey is better. <laughs> Yo, but. But, yo, so I was getting Subway chicken sandwich, and my trainer runs into me, and he's like, yo, what are you doing? And I'm like, this is my pregame. And he's like, why? And I remember thinking, like, yo, this is how I'm saving money. Like, I'm saving, I'm saving. But I'm the seventh pick, and I have no idea what's going on. But that's really how, you know, clueless I was and how new I was to all this. You know, I'm coming in. I'm, I just turned 19. I'm just coming into the league, and I'm new to all this. So, you know... It's, it's really a blessing that I was just so caught up in just trying to be good at basketball. Um, and everything else, I just learned. I just learned going through it, you know. So that was really my early experience being in the league. That's, man, that's, that's hilarious, man. That's, <laughs> I was walking somewhere. <laughs> um, so uh, there's something I wanted to address. I spoke to Matthew Ryder, and shout out to Matthew. You know, he's been inspirational for a mentor and a friend to us for years to uh, kids. And, you know, he brought something up that was, you know, I think very important. Uh, I'm going to read a stack real quick, and then we can talk about it after. Um, in high school, there are about 500-some-odd um, basketball players who play in high school basketball. Five, five what? 500,000 high okay. school basketball players. Yeah, yeah. Um, about eight, about three percent, three percent of those guys will go on to play college basketball. Then there's about one percent of those eighteen to eighteen thousand that go from high school to college that will play professional basketball. Now that, now that's NBA, Europe, G League, CBA, South America, wherever you want, pick one. And the the amount of those players that go to the NBA is point one percent. And I wanted to speak to how balancing self-awareness and confidence at the same time allowed yourself 
myself to to be aware of what we were doing and how we were going to implement and take advantage of those opportunities because I know we're t we're just talking about yeah one day we woke up and we was like let's just work harder than everybody else but you have to put that in the context because with um with that like I was a high jumper if I had put the same effort in the high jumping although the career my career would have been successful. I don't think it would have been as successful. So you have to be very um, cognizant of what you put your energy to. And that's where the self-awareness piece comes in. For me, at a younger age, I was watching you, and I was like, man, I want to be an All-American. I want to be ranked in the country. I want to be you know, a high draft pick. But then I realized that wasn't my path, and that wasn't for me. I understood that, and I was a realist, and I was real with myself. So I pivoted how I looked. Now, when everybody starts their playing basketball, they think of themselves as their favorite player. Michael Jordan, you know, whoever, all these guys who you look up to when you're younger. But everybody wants to be those guys. But, so for me, I realized at a younger age that I wasn't going to be MJ. I wasn't even going to be the wild. But I looked at my favorite players like a team, like Kevin Garnett like Amari Stoudemire, and I was like, look, if I can just take pieces of their game and combine it with my work ethic and how hard I play on the court and my athleticism, I think I could still be successful. But you have to be comfortable and self-aware to the point where you're like, you know what, I'm not going to be this guy. So I have to be, I have to change my focus and go this way. And I think the same is to say for just picking the sport. I know everybody wants to be in the NBA. Everybody wants to play professional basketball. But when you're, you also, first and foremost, you have to look yourself in the mirror and tell yourself, is this what I want to do? And am I able? Is there a pathway for me to do so? And um, I really, luckily at a younger age and having the right people around me, like I said, um, like you said before, I... I, I just I told myself that this is what you know, I, I knew I knew this is the way I wanted to go, but I un also understood what I had to do to implement it and if it was a reality. And there's certain steps that you have to achieve and certain things that you have to achieve or reach to know that it's a possibility. So by the time I was a junior and NBA scouts were coming to our practices at GW, that's when I realized, okay. I can do this, but you have to be very self-aware in doing that. So you, you should speak to that too about who, like um, your approach to the game and understanding who you were. Yeah, obviously you were highly touted, and, but people have to understand the work that you put in also, also um, coincided with your return of investment. You put your focus into a craft that you knew, that you saw a window of opportunity. And once you saw that, it was over. Yeah, no, what... What you're saying is so true, man. I think that a lot of time it, it first starts with being honest with yourself. Uh, you know, I think even with doing this show, I think we're talking about being pros and, and all that, but people, people don't realize that there's, you know, it's, it's a level and steps to it. Uh, there's a lot of people who are achieving a lot of things, but sometimes you're setting, you know, you're setting yourself up and not being honest with yourself in terms of what you achieve. And what I mean by that is, to get a scholarship, you know, to get a, st a scholarship, that's a huge step, you know, to, to go to school and get free education, that's a huge step, you know, you might not become a professional basketball player, but you're giving yourself a chance to do other things, you know, and sometimes you might not realize it, and it's the toughest thing to tell players sometimes, you know, anything could happen, you know, and God forbid, like an injury or any setback or anything could happen, but what are you doing to take advantage of what you're being given? You know, you're not just being told to be a basketball player. You're given a platform where you can do so many other things. So don't cut yourself short in just thinking, oh, I'm going to make it no matter what. You know, and, and my friend Joe Kim used to always say to us, even when we were having the best record in the NBA, you know, we'll, he would come in in the locker room and he used to say, listen, humble yourself before the game humbles you. You know, and, and what that meant to us was all this can be gone. You know, all this, and, and it happened to us. You know, it happened overnight when Derrick got hurt where we felt we were the best team and we we're going to go and win it. And it happened where we, the game humbled us, you know, it, it, and it could happen in your life. It could happen with anything. You know, with me, from a young age, I realized how lucky I was with everything I was getting. You know, I, I went from 
you know, being in Egypt playing, uh, you know, playing football and soccer in the streets. I've never played with a real ball. You know, growing up as a refugee, I never played with a real ball. I was playing with socks that we made out of just balloon and put socks and duct tape. I've never, ever had a real uh, soccer ball in my life. You know, I wore the same shoes that I wore to school. I played football in. I did everything in the same shoes. So I came from a background that I had nothing. And then I went to England and I, and I always said, yo, this is a lot. This is enough. I was playing in grass. I was playing with real soccer ball. I was playing in the field with real goalposts. You know, this was a blessing, you know. And then all of a sudden, I'm at Brixton, you know, with everything that is, I'm, I'm playing indoor. I'm playing basketball indoors for the first time. In Egypt, we're playing outdoors, rims are barely on. So I kept, I kept telling myself, like, yo, this is a lot. Just focus on being better for tomorrow. And, and I always tell people this, man. Like, I'm, the, I'm, I'm the, like, the nicest, most competitive guy you will ever meet. I would never tell you the things that I tell myself to be the best I could be. Like, someone could say one thing right now, and I will act like it doesn't bother me at all. You know, and, and I'll move on like it doesn't bother me. But in my head, when I go and work out, I'm working out because so-and-so said I'm not going to be good for the next game. So, and I used to sell this to myself. There used to be days where I'm, I look at the schedule and I'm playing so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so and, -so and, and I'm leading the league in minutes. And I used to say, yo, somebody is watching me and I have to be great today. And I just find an inner push in myself. But... I never looked too far ahead. I was just, I wanted to be great for what my next thing is. When I went in the gym and I was taking shots, I was taking shots to be better. Uh, I wasn't just going through the motion, you know? So, and that's what I always tell young kids. Every time you do something, be the best at it. Scott Skiles used to, oh, my coach Scott Skiles used to tell me when I was in Chicago that every time Reggie Miller took a jump shot, he took a jump shot to make it. He didn't just take a jump shot. You know, and that's a different mindset. Whatever you're doing, you're doing it with a purpose. You're not just going through the motion. So whatever you're doing, and this is my message to young kids, don't look at someone else's life and try to make that your life. Your path is different. You know, your greatness is you that got to, you know, you got to find your path and everyone writes their story. But if you're trying to live someone else's life or trying to be there too fast, it's not going to happen. That's not what God has for you. You're, you're, your life and your mission is, is different than anyone else, you know? And that's, that's crazy you say that because, again, seeing all of that and watching you and, and this, that, and, this, and your successes and us being so close, um, people often ask me, like, well, how would you, um, how do you look at that? I was like, I only look at it as inspiration. And um, it was enough for me to be motivated, like, at no point in time did I ever be like, well, I, w I want that. I wanted it in a different way. I wanted it, but I wanted to work to get it. And I wanted to deserve it. I didn't want anything to be handed to me. And when, you know, when I saw all your successes and everything you was doing, I made sure I didn't try to live your life because it was gonna, it was never gonna be enough for me. I was like, look, instead of go, achieve it. If you get there, great. And then um, see what happens when you get there. And then that's just how I looked at it. Like, yeah, I only played, three, four, four years in the NBA. But again, I have friends who were at a young age highly touted and never made it, never made it even out of after college or even made it to college. And I got an opportunity to be established in the NBA, play the game that I love and still have that impact um, on the game. So I was definitely mindful of that. But um, got a I wanna, few minutes. Real quick, before, before we jump on questions and stuff, I want you to talk a little bit about um, you know, being being a pro and dealing with, obviously, I, I wouldn't call it, I don't even know if I call it setback, but dealing with things that you can't control. For example, working as hard as you can, but a team cutting you or a team saying they don't want you or being traded or going, you know, another country and playing because a lot of people are going to go through that. And me and you talked about how our path is different, you know, because I want to talk about my 10 years with Chicago and, you know, the ups and downs, but also the day that I was traded and how that felt. I hope we have time. I know a lot of people ask me about that. Most of my career, when I got traded, people kept asking me about it. Uh, so I want you to talk a little bit, to, you know, in your experience, what was that like and how you kept getting up and, and getting better? Man, that's an, I'm not going to lie. That's an emotional question, bro, because for me... 
now that I'm retired and I look at my career and i am played 11 years playing for 18 different teams and becoming a journeyman, um, there was a time where I hated it. I hated how journeymen were looked at. I hated that I wasn't established enough to be with a team for multiple years. Um, but those were defining moments for me. You know, I remember my, my rookie year in Dallas. Um, my, my contract was guaranteed at 12 p.m., let's just say, Ju uh, July 15th. And my lease on my house was, was I, I, I scheduled it so that my lease and my contracts were at the exact same time. So my contract would be guaranteed at 12 p.m., July 15th, 2007. And I would just sign the lease for the next year. I remember going through summer league, playing well, and just, you know, anticipating my second year. Mind you, I'm on Dallas where the, we won 67 games. We're the best team in the league. And I'm backing up the MVP. Or I'm playing behind the MVP. So obviously there wasn't minutes for undrafted rookie like myself. And, you know, I spent most of the year in the G League. And then when it came to time to resign, I remember getting a phone call at 1158. And it was the GM of the Mavericks. And I looked at the phone and I was like, look, as long as you don't answer the phone, you should be fine, right? And once 12 o'clock hits, you won't be cut. He called, they called me and, you know, uh, I answered the phone and he was like, you know, we go through the small talk and then he tells me, um, we're going to have to go in another direction. So mind you, I get cut. They, they don't pick up the second year of my contract, but I have to be out of my apartment the same day. I remember having to move, pack up a whole house by myself. And luckily my girlfriend at the time, she helped me pack up. Two days later, I was in Venice playing in Italy. And, you know, people always ask me um, what that's like. I always tell people the NBA is great. It's the pinnacle. It's, 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 it's amazing. It's the top of your craft. And this is where our careers will differ. And part of the reason why I'm here today, the NBA is great. But it's not all it's cracked up to be, meaning that there's so much more that goes on in it, goes on in the league, and you've got to experience this later on in your career, so much more that goes on in the NBA and none of it is basketball. And I've been, I've been cut maybe four or five different times when I, uh, for different teams I've played on. And instead of getting bitter and feeling sorry for myself, I remember my brother, when I was in high school, he, he pulled me aside and I never told the story, but this, this is what helped me look at life differently. He pulled me, he ejected me from a game. He was referring a game I did uh, in high school as a camp counselor and my own brother ejected me from the game then comes to me after the game and hems me up by my uh, by my shirt and I was I was on my high horse I thought I was good and this and the third and he cusses me out and tells me nobody's gonna care if you make it or not if you if you if you don't succeed the word is gonna keep spinning and the clock is gonna keep ticking so you need to figure this out and stop and stop thinking you're better than who you are or what you are. And from that day forward, I always just took a humble approach. And I used certain things to motivate me. Getting, getting cut like that, uh, I just needed to motivate me and just become the best player I could be. And it was difficult, but I always used it as more fuel to my fire to be great in another situation. So that was, that was um, I mean, again, we can, I can talk about, for hours about my experience was getting cut and everything, but that was just my mindset whenever that would happen to me, was to pivot and figure out what I could do better next time so that this doesn't happen again. Yeah, no, that's amazing, bro. That's, that's a different mindset right there. Um, I don't know if we have, do we, do we have more than an hour? Are, are, we, are, we, uh, are we considered big time where we could, we could go more than an hour? Or are we just, that, that's, uh, that's on you. That's on you. Uh, uh, let me ask Ben to find out. Yeah, because cause, I mean, I, I'll talk a little bit, but I feel like we should take some questions because yeah. for me to cover to cover the 10 years uh, before I got traded uh, in we Chicago. Need hour each. We need an hour each. I, I know, man. It's going to be long. But just to, to talk about what you're talking about, because for me, it's a bit different. Um, obviously, drafted at such a young age, being in Chicago for 10 years, what a lot of people don't know is before... Before I went to Chicago, I've never, ever lived anywhere in my life more than five years. 
so I've just, I've always been moving, but I've been so blessed where I always felt like I'm in a family atmosphere. You know, if you think about it, when we were in Egypt, we were close uh, as a family. Uh, we moved to the U uh, UK. I go to Brixton and I had a family atmosphere. You know, I go to Blair Academy, New Jersey High School. I was in a boarding school around family. Um, I go to Duke and I felt like I was around family. Uh, I come to Chicago and I was in Chicago for 10 years mm -hmm. and I felt like I grew up in Chicago. Uh, I felt like I went through a lot. I was doing a lot with the community. Uh, mind you, people that, you know, talking about Sam who was always parking our cars when we got to the stadium, to Eddie who was giving out the tickets at, at the front gate. Uh, people that were in a family room. I've known them for 10 years, so it was every day, it was a routine. And doing stuff with the community, working with, you know, uh, doing stuff doing Thanksgiving with the South Sudanese community, with the Lost Boys. It was just, I felt like I was doing a lot and I felt like I was home. And, you know, I remember right before I was traded, um, a couple of days before I was talking to one of my teammates. And mind you, uh, how everything works out man like going from eight years from you know not speaking english to being drafted now i went to one of the you know best franchise one of the most known mm -hmm. basketball teams in the world that jersey and now I'm, I'm here i am and i'm talking to my friend and my friend's like yo you know that uh, you're uh fourth in scoring um in, in chicago history and he's like bob love is ahead of you but you could catch him you know bob love jersey is retired so i'm like yo man uh it just woke me up like yo i could i could i could do that then he's like you know you're like this in rebounding you know you're this in assists you know and this in most games played and i never looked at it that way i'm i'm looking back like yo it's been 10 years so now i'm motivated and mind you i went through a lot in in terms of injuries and that day, I think a lot of people remember when I ended up in a hospital uh, where, you know, it's the scariest thing that ever happened in my life, being in a hospital and going through that. And I'm sitting at home, mind you, my family was visiting then. This is a, like right after Christmas. Uh, my family is visiting and I get a phone call at like 1.30 in the morning. Uh, and luckily I was up. And the weirdest thing is, it, it's so weird, but the day I got traded, my, uh, my lights went off in the house, which I still think is so, is so weird. And I had this TV that I had my whole career. The TV went off. It just wouldn't come back on. And I had a bad feeling. It was just a bad vibe. It was crazy. And I, I remember picking up the phone, and I knew it. I just, I just knew something, something ain't right. I, I don't get phone calls this late. And I was told that I got traded. Um, and I asked where and wouldn't tell me right away, said I had to wait until the process goes through. And I remember trying to explain to my mom that I got traded and she didn't understand what that means. Uh, and pretty much that means packing my stuff after 10 years and I have to be somewhere else tomorrow. And till now I look back and most of my career, I mean, when I look back, I really struggled in Cleveland. And I don't mean that in just you know, the fans were great, the people, the organization was great, but I was always looking back on what Chicago was doing for a whole year. It took me a while to get over it because I felt like, yo, 10 years, and here I am telling people, oh, it don't matter, but I kept looking back like, man, I could have got third in scoring. It's, it's Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, Bob Love, and, wow, you know, Jerry Salone, his jersey is retired, but I'm ahead of him. So I'm thinking, yo, this is, I could keep going. I could keep increasing this. And then you wake up and you realize, yo, it's gone. You know, you're not, this is done. And what, what am I going to play now? I'm lucky to get any, you know, two more years in. And I ended up playing, luckily, five more years. But this is how, you know, fast it happens. And I know our path is different, but that's what I had to go through. I, I don't want to keep, we might have to continue this, but we should uh -huh. take a few questions. Well, what do you think? I think, yeah, I think, you know, we only got to, like, the third part of this, this episode. So I think uh, in about three, four minutes, we'll sign off and then sign back on and then probably just finish up with the questions. Wait, what are you saying? What are you saying? I thought, I, thought if you got a, I thought if you got a blue tick on your name, you get extra hours. What's, what's, what's happening? Yeah, they haven't granted it yet. Benson said they haven't granted it yet, but it's going to come. So hopefully in some of the upcoming episodes, they will... Um, 
they will will have more than an hour. I and mean, hopefully Luau's figured out how to use his Instagram then. But um Listen, listen, I, I didn't even know with the blue tick man for a while. But anyway, this this, this we ain't we ain't, we ain't get extended. So wait, so I gotta get back out and log in, but then your connection takes No, nah, nah, relax, 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 relax. Quiet for that, bro. <laughs> I'm here. Right, we'll see, we'll see. Listen, I'm so, just I'm gonna do my part. I'm gonna log off. Wait, do we log off now or do we take So let's just do it now. Everybody who's watching, give us two minutes. Lose good. We're gonna end the live and start it over and start over again just to make sure we have um extra time and we don't get cut off like the last time. So we're gonna yeah, we ain't, we ain't big we ain't big time. We ain't big time. We gotta log out and log back in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we gotta log out and log back in. So um give us a couple minutes. Um we'll be right back. Wait, we're leaving now? Might as well just do it now because I don't want to have to answer a question and then all of a sudden cut off in between um, answering. It's only got five minutes. Listen, so I'm going to end it. Yes. Save the thing. Yes. Send it to you. Yes. And log, and log back in. Let's dance. All right. Say no more. Save it. Yeah, but like I was saying, it's a lot to cover. Can you guys hear me? Oh, I can't hear you now. I couldn't hear you before. What were you Wait. talking on mute? What kind of movement is that? Wait, I was talking on mute? Yeah, nobody can hear you. What are you talking yeah. about, bro? I said some stuff that I can't even repeat. I, I, I didn't even... Listen, my brain was on fire. I said some... I was kicking some knowledge, bro. Nah, it was probably some, some BS from South London anyway, so we didn't miss anything. Yo, so the whole time... Man. The whole time, it was 15 seconds. What you mean? Nah, it was two minutes. It was two minutes, bro. You, like, I wish people would have heard what I said. I, I, I was kicking some knowledge, bro, some important stuff. Yeah. Hey, Jaflo, I see, I see Deezer. Deezer, kru 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 I see you, I see you, Deezer. Man, like, Flo. Jaflo. Ah, like, like Jaflo, I like it. Nah, it's a lot of people, man. So, so are you saying we got another hour? We have another hour. Whether we use the whole thing is a whole nother question. So, all right, all right. so we got to get back to what? What was I talking about? About being, uh, being you got overworked. traded, and you found out. Um, you just it was it was difficult. To, you found out at like midnight that you had gotten traded, um, and um, how you were dealing with it. Yeah. So, you know, after ten years of one place, and you know, first of all, I'm I'm really blessed to to be in one place for ten years because I hear a lot, you know, NBA players and. Even European guys, guys who played in Europe, talking about the, the difficulty of just switching, you know, teams and everything. I was lucky to just be. I lived in the same city. Um, I lived in Northbrook when I was in Chicago the whole time. You know, um, just just blessed to be with one team. I didn't know any better. I just I couldn't relate. I seen a lot of teammates come and go. Um, I seen, you know us go to as far as we can in the playoffs and not making the playoffs fans loving you fans not loving you uh you know i've seen it all but i didn't know how to deal with not being wanted as you know some people will put it a different way but they always say if one person doesn't want you someone else does uh but for chicago i just felt like the reason i was traded uh, didn't really make sense for me at the time, you know, because because I was coming off with just two-time All-Star. Um, and when I was traded at the time, I felt like I understood uh, Tibbs' system to the fullest. I was playing a lot of minutes, but I felt like I figured it out. You know, it takes you a while. When I was playing with Scott Skiles, I felt like I, w I figured it out. It took me a while, I figured it out, and then he was gone. Then I struggled with a lot of new coaches. When Tibbs came in, I felt like he understood my game and what I needed to do. So every day it made my job a lot easier. So after being an all-star, uh, two-time all-star, I came the third year and I was like, you know what? This is going to be my best year. And at the time when I was traded, I was averaging almost 20 points. Um, and it was one of my best years. So I was looking forward to being an all-star third time. And when I got traded, I just, you know, I, I didn't speak about it, but I kept checking what Chicago was doing. Um, you know, like before games, I was like, yo, I know I was close with those guys. Those were not only my teammates, but I was very close with that team. And it just felt different from far. You know, it wasn't a team that I just joined. Um, even when I was watching the game, I was recognizing some of the fans that I've seen for 10 years. 
Uh, so, so it was definitely different, and I dealt with it differently. And, you know, I tried. When I got to Cleveland, we were already, you know, we've lost so many games. We're pretty much out of the playoffs. But that organization took me in. I became very close with a lot of people there, and I just felt, you know, very close to them. But I, I just I, I didn't feel myself. I wasn't – I couldn't be the Luol that I was for the past 10 years. Uh, you know, and it took me a while until – I came to Miami, uh, and when I came to Miami, believe it or not, for the most parts, when I was in Chicago playing the Heat, I always disliked them because uh, we wanted to beat them. You know, I didn't know, I didn't know D Wade that well. I didn't know Bosch that well. Uh, most of the guys that were here, uh, Chalmers, Cole, uh, Birdman, and then when I came. Uh, when I came over, it was different, man. I, I just felt like I was back in Chicago. It was a family atmosphere. We did a lot together. It was a close team. And right away, I started to be, you know, what, you know, be myself and play. And then I realized, I was like, yo, you know when people say, like, you could thank God, but I just felt like God loves me. And the reason why I say that is because I look back and everyone's path is different. But is, is the dog back? No, they're disaffecting my apartment. Oh, okay, okay. All right. Be safe, man. <laughs> I hope everything is okay out there. <laughs> nah, but, uh, you know, I felt, I felt it's like... It's just back. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, was always, I was always around a family atmosphere, and, I, and I'm at my best when I'm around, you know, a family atmosphere, and I got that again when I came to, to Miami. So that's really, you know, what I, I learned from that, you know? That's great, man. That's... Um... It's definitely a good, good point. And, you know, just to piggyback off of that, you know, when I retired and came on this side of the game, I think my best experiences as a player was what I was going to try to implement as a GM. And that was going to try and bring this family um, and close-knit um, organization style together. And so that, you know, the people you're working with are not only your co-workers or your teammates, but they're a family, like you said. So that's um, that's always good to know. Um, moving forward, uh, a question asked by Big Bro. He said uh, the difference between, for me, for the NBA and top-level Europe. And I think the quickest and easiest way to answer that question, I would say, is 450 players in the NBA. There's probably, and it's an arbitrary number, but there's probably – let's just say 3,000 professional basketball players across the world who have an NBA skill or talent. Now, I often tell players who are, who are trying to get in the league and chase the league, especially because I was that player. You know, I always saw myself as an NBA player. I always felt like my talent deserved to be in the NBA. And there was a time when I was consumed by being in the NBA. And then one day I just woke up and was like, um, when I got cut for the fifth time, I just told myself, um, just be the best player you can be. You know, you've been established in the NBA. You've had that time. You've had that experience. Um, be the best player you can be and know that the opportunity is to be ready. And I always tell guys, you don't have to chase the NBA to be an NBA player. With all those other players and, and only 450 spots in the league, the numbers don't add up. So you could be an NBA caliber player, just that the opportunity either hasn't pre presented itself or the timing isn't isn't right yet. And you can, and that's how I saw it. I saw myself as a guy who had played at the highest level, um, had his chance in the league, and you know this, that that time had passed, and then I was I was okay with it. And I was, but I just wanted to be the best I could be. And so for me, the biggest difference between high level Europe and the NBA, there really isn't that much because you look at a player like. Luka Doncic or um, Ricky Rubio, like those guys were over there in Europe playing well, but they get to the NBA and they just the games are so much better. They, they the games open up and they blossom. So I think there's there's a lot more players that I that could play in the NBA in Europe, and it's um, it just speaks to the talent and the level of play over there in Europe and playing in the Euroleague and, and against those type of players it, it just prepared me and uh, allowed me to understand the difference between the NBA and Europe, but let me know that there wasn't that big of a drop-off if I played there. So I was okay with doing that in that regard. What we got next? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if my thing froze, but uh, it's, it's, 
Are you getting are you getting uh questions? Because Yeah, I got you. I I got about thirty questions here. How are the questions how are the questions going to you? Are they at at, at Pops or am, am I uh, So so this so this is what happened, everybody, just to break it down for you. So you told the story <laughs> about his laptop and never using a computer before and him um and him always writing his um Matan, I'm gonna answer that question too. Him always having to write his papers. So we we, we put this live document together where all the questions, my brother and my sister. Oh, they're coming up. No, 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 they're coming up now. They're people coming up. Just, so how do you nah, people, people were take, nah, people people were taking a break. They were take they were listening, bro. That's what it was. They were listening. I got it. Nah, you trying to hey, what are you trying to say about the live doc? <laughs> hey Karen, I see the question. I'm not answering that one. I see what you're doing there. Um Let's see what we got here. And and mind you, like I said, this was supposed to be one episode, but we only got to go to a quarter of what we were supposed to talk about. So we're probably going to end up, you know, answering a few more questions and you know, touching base with everybody that's talking, and then continue this episode um, another day. Uh, so what we got? All right. So okay, this is a great. Here I am going to answer your question actually. So for me. I had to pack up my house. Um, wait, wait, what's the question? I'm going to tell you now. So uh -oh. Kieran asked me were the fans in Venice, in Italy, the best Treviso, the best fans in Italy. And he's being funny because of what happened to me when I was there. Um, <laughs> so I tell you, I, I, I pack up, I end up having to go, I end up having to go to Italy to go play. And I remember getting there and... Man, it was a rude awakening. Even though I was born and raised in London, coming all the way over to Italy, just um, I was I was I was in a bad place mentally because I really wanted to um, stay in the NBA. And two days prior, I was an NBA player. Now all of a sudden, I'm playing in in Italy. So we get there. We have you know I'm I'm like I said I was consumed the whole year with just being an NBA player when I played on um, when I played and. Whenever I didn't perform well, it, it I, I got to me mentally. And that's when I had to start thinking and looking in the mirror and telling myself, look, you too busy being consumed and concerned with what's going on in the NBA. It's time you um, just, again, focus on being the best player you could be. Anyway, the season's going on. Uh, again, I'm just adjusting to playing the European-style way of basketball. And... We, we had a really talented team. We probably had the most talented team in the whole league. So we were dubbed to win the whole thing. But we just didn't have chemistry. And we kept losing. And I remember we played to the actual best team in Italy, and they beat us by 50 points. And that, the season just went downhill. We were losing games. Danilo Gallinari was like 18 at the time, and he played for Milan. They came to Venice to play us, and he had like 30. Duncan all over us and killed us. And now in, in Italy or in Europe, they have these fans they call the Ultra. Now, if you ever watch a soccer game, those fans screaming and, and yelling and singing and got their shirts off and going crazy, these are the ultras. They pretty much take that same soccer mindset and concept and just bring it inside to a basketball arena. So anyway, we lose the game. All the fans leave and wait for us outside. Mind you, they, they had done this before, and they they normally let me go because I just played hard. They, they appreciated the way I played and how I went about things, so they didn't they – didn't, um, they would never really fault me for, you know, the way we played. Today was going to be a little different. Uh, I remember driving out, and my girlfriend at the time was was sitting there, and she uh, there was like it seemed like thirty guys outside. They stopped me in front of the car, and I'm thinking they're going to let me go. So I start to drive, and the dude puts his hand on the hood of my car, then jumps on the hood of my car. Man, I tell you, I took my seatbelt off and put the car in park so fast and got out, and was like. And to me, at this point, I had never seen, um, I had never seen anything like that. I'd never seen any any fan so passionate about a sport to the point that they would go to this extent. So, I'm, so I remember getting out of the car. One dude slides behind me and closes my car door, and it was like eight or nine of them that were in front of me. And I'm thinking, ooh, this could get ugly. I hope you know nobody has a shank or something. So I'm talking to them, and they're calling me. They call me all types of names. 
all types of racial um, slurs and everything. And I'm like, yo, this is a basketball game. Like, it, it can't be that serious. And they're getting closer and closer. Mind you, the car is right behind me. And when they get, when they kind of corner me, I'm like, yo, y'all got to back up. Like, this is, like, y'all getting too close. Next thing I know, bang, I get hit with a glass of beer. Bang, get hit with another one. Now I can't see. I don't know what's going on. I can't see. And they jump me. What? They jump me. And um, <laughs> I remember somebody just grabbing my eyes. I can't see. I grab somebody and I throw them. And the arena we played in goes down. It, it, it's, you got to take steps to go down, but they're concrete steps. And the person who grabbed me, I remember just throwing them. And the dude fell down the, and flew down the steps. Uh, next, somebody else comes. Not, listen, not to not to cut you off, but I saw Kieran just said you jumped them. They didn't jump me. <laughs> <laughs> listen, I noticed, you, yo, you had a little twisted story. Uh, <laughs> yo, uh, Kieran just said he jumped them. Yo, Kieran. <laughs> yo, yo, as a GM, I do feel funny telling the story, but this was, this was funny. <laughs> this is to my experiences as a player, so don't judge me for this. But so. One guy grabs me, a second person tries to grab me. Mind you, this sounds like it took five, 10 minutes. This happened all within like 30, 40 seconds. Somebody else grabs me, I push him down the stairs, and it's, um, <laughs> I push him down the stairs, and I realize it's a cop. I'm like, oh, damn. And then somebody grabs me by my sweater. I remember I used to dress up for the games because I was a professional and this was my job, so I would dress up like I was in the league and just dress right. up like. Wait. And girlfriend had bought me a polo sweater. And, I, man, it was smooth, man. I loved it. And I remember um, the dude, somebody grabbed my sweater and I closed my eyes and just turned around and um, caught him, knocked out. Wait, my the cop? Huh? The cop? No, the cop was downstairs. He was oh. downstairs already. He said, yeah. he's gone. So, <laughs> after, so. I punched the guy because at the same time, it's me and eight or nine guys. And I'm like, look, I'm about to get hurt. So I start defending myself. And then when I hit the guy, everybody in the group kind of backs up like, oh, this Ashanti dude means means means, means business. And at, at this point, I'm not trying to be a peacemaker. I'm not trying to stop anybody's fight. And I, I'm, I'm like, well, where y'all at? Let's go. I'm thinking this, I'm Bruce Lee and, and the dragon. I'm ready to take everybody on. And I turn around and see the guy I just hit on the floor. And I'm, I got, I'm, I'm about to kick a home run. I'm about to kick a home run. I'm about to kick a field goal. And I wanted to kick him in the face. And I closed my eyes and ended up kicking him in the stomach. Luckily, I, luckily I did that. My teammate came and grabbed me because there was like 20 more people coming for me. And it would have been good. And I just remember that. Like, man, had I been in the NBA, this would have never happened. And the fact that, you know, my own, you know, our own fans jumped, jumped me and, you know, this experience, I was like, man, this, this can't be life. This can't be right. Like, I'm about to stay here. Uh, I'm, about to, I'm playing here. I'm loving this. Uh, I love this sport, but this is what the sport had did to me. So I remember calling my brother after, like, just, I don't even remember what I said. I just remember yelling, like, yo, get me out of here. Like, these fans, these fans tried to jump me and I put hands on them and I'm leaving. The very next day I'm coming to practice, I get hit by a car. I get hit by a car. And I end up being knocked out. My car was still in drive um, as I got hit. So I'm, <laughs> I'm unconscious, but my car is still driving. What? And you want to hear the craziest thing? I was so blessed to be um, and in this moment. I got hit by a car. I'm knocked out. And it just so happens an ambulance is, is coming in the opposite direction and sees the whole thing happen. And the dude quickly comes, and I remember just like waking up, and the dude is reaching across me to and puts his hand on the on the brake to to put the car in, in park. And I'm woozy. I get to the hospital, and I'm laying there looking up. And I'm in this hospital room, like, what's going on? And I remember the doctor talking to my team manager and telling him, oh, he may have a, uh, something wrong with his eye. He has a slight concussion, but he'll be okay to play. Luke, yeah, I, I, had a, I, couldn't, I couldn't see out my right eye, and I had a crazy headache. So 
I remember calling my brother and my dad like, yo, come get me, I'm out. And the team, because I had the British passport, the team really didn't want me to leave because that's, you know, when you have a passport and can play at the same time, that's a your limited commodity over there. So, you know, long story short, me and my dad um, and my brother, they come check me out, make sure I'm good. I go back to the U.S. The doctor tells me I had a detached retina. And, like, had I tried to play sooner than I did, I could have done some real damage. And it's, um, yeah, that's, and that's, literally, that's my first experience in Europe. That was just Italy. I played another eight, nine years uh, in Europe and in the NBA. So that's why I'm saying, like, this episode alone, I could tell you stories, uh, you know, about. And that was just two days. I didn't even tell you about how, um, you know, the, the next time fans try to jump me, and I'm starting to think it's me. Why Bro, trying to jump I, me. I, was, I was about to say that. Why, why are you always getting jumped? And, and no, I no, no, no. I said, no, 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 they didn't try. No, you me. said the next time. So, so this was, so that's another story. This was later on in my career. <laughs> when I got how, to how many times, how many times did the fans jump you, Pops? <laughs> so, okay, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I misquoted. This was when I was um, uh, in Greece. And I was in Turkey, but I was playing in Greece. And I got into a fight, but that's another that's another story. You, 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 you. <laughs> yeah, all these all these fights, man. Yo, y'all need to stop picking on pops, man. I, I, <laughs> listen, even though I don't believe it, Kieran, I'm with you on this one. Oh, I know, I know all of them weren't the fans. You probably were driving. And you saw the fans, you're like, yo, I'm about to start something with these guys. Just, <laughs> let me just go just get pick, these guys. I just picked nine dudes to fight with. Yeah, you're probably like, yo, baby, let me park the car real quick. I'll be right back. <laughs> nah, uh, but, uh, someone asked me, uh, you know, the, it, it's a few questions, but... Uh, 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 I'm here, I'm here. What's happening? I told you that I have to... Um, uh, this affect my apartment, so I'm I'm relocating. Oh, okay, so should should we wait for you to relocate? No, that's why I'm uh, telling, that's why they have these things called mobile devices. All right, so yo, so someone I forgot who asked, but someone asked me a question about uh, what was it like being teammates with um, Andres Nozioni. Um, that's one, and also another question was. How did you guys deal with injuries uh, throughout your career? Uh, which is also a good question. So first, let me just talk about Nozioni a little bit. Uh, for, you know, basketball players, especially Bulls fans who remember Noach, uh, Noach was uh, probably <coughs> one of the toughest, if not the toughest teammates I've had. Oh, yes. Um, and, you know, sometimes it seemed like he was doing things by accident, but Noach always planned everything that he did. Uh, and what I mean by that was we would be playing certain teams and we'll play certain, uh, you know, certain players or the main players, somebody that, you know, we're focusing on stopping or the superstar of the team. And Noach would come in and he would just be like, listen, um, when they drive in, the first foul is on me. And we're all looking at him like, what? He's like, I'm going to take the first foul, but we're not going to make it soft. I'm going to foul him. Um, and we all knew every game we had, we were going to get one foul that would just send a message to whoever we're playing. And me and Noach used to, Noach started the first nine games my rookie year, then I started after that. And, you know, I learned a lot from Noach coming in because at the now, time... Are you Noach, saying he's your favorite teammate because you took his spot and you feel bad? I didn't take his spot. So why did you start after him then? We were sharing spots. We, you know, we share spots. So, yeah, yeah, this is my good friend, man. Don't start stuff. So, you know, Noach, if you're out there watching, you know, we're cool. But, uh, no, nah, seriously, I learned a lot from him being a rookie. But um, there's one time Noach, Noach would always get text. Uh, he would always get a tech in the game. And Noach would come up to me. And at the time, you know, especially my rookie year, I didn't get a lot of text. I, I never used to say nothing. I was just playing my game wasn't arguing with anyone and Noach would come up to me and he's like, and he would say stuff like, yo, Lou, um, you know, you have to get the next tech. <laughs> and I'm looking what? at him like, do I'm, I? looking at him, I'm looking at him like, yo, what do you need? He's like, you got to get the next one. And I'm like, what, what do you need? He's like, if I get two, I'm at the game. You have to, I have one already. You have to get the next one. I'm like, nah, man, I'm good. If I get a tech, I get a tech, but I'm not about to go out there and plan it. <laughs> but that was, you know, some of my stories about Noach. But 
let's talk a little bit about, uh, and then we could take questions. Let's talk a little bit about dealing with injuries. Because, um, okay. you know, I, I always tell people I had, you know, right away starting my rookie year, I had an injury, um, which, you know, was my first surgery, obviously, like right away. I, I fell, I went for a dunk and someone took my legs. See, that's the uh, problem. That's the problem. I've known you for over 20 years and I've only ever seen you dunk twice. Okay. You know, I know, I know, um, I know your thing is at Pops. Uh, so I'll send you some highlights uh, back. You know, I, I played a lot of games. Uh, I got a lot of dunks, Pops. It's just, mm, I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't out there saying meet me at the rim or windmilling. I was just, listen, I was saving my energy, uh, my energy. I was just tapping it in a little dunk where I was saying, listen, I wasn't out there windmilling going between my legs and everyone remembers. Nah, that's not me. I'm hey, that was my path, man. That was the only way I was going to get in, so I, I had to do that. Listen, you, you're a highlight. You're a highlight tape, a highlight type of player. Like, you went out there, and you got a windmill or behind the back between the legs, and everyone was talking. To, for me, listen, it was two points. I'm going to get those two points. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save as much energy getting those two points and run back. Uh, but, nah, you know, um, so for me, I I uh, I was going for a layup. I was gonna finger roll it because you know we don't want to say dunk. I was gonna finger roll it, and someone hit my leg, and I came down on my wrist. And I remember, uh, you know, I I, I didn't want to believe it, but I went to the free throw line, and you know, right before I shot the free throw, they called a timeout. And I remember coming down and sitting on the bench, and I'm listening to the coach talking. And as soon as the coach finished speaking, I went to get up and I couldn't lift my wrist. Um, right away, I knew something was wrong, but my mindset was, I don't want to be out of the game. Uh, so I went and took the two free throws and I could barely get the ball to the rim. And I was subbed. I knew something was wrong, but I thought I broke, you know, my, my wrist. I went in and I got the MRI the next day and it showed that I tore all my ligaments in my wrist, uh, right here, I still have the surgery all across, right? Um, and at the time, I was sent to a doctor in Chicago, which I'm not going to say his name, but when I got to the doctor, mind you, I'm 19 years old, uh, I just started my career, this doctor decided to tell me that, you know, we have to fuse your wrist and you have to think of something else outside of basketball. What? Yeah, and at the time I was like, this can't be real. You know, like I can't just, this came to the league. It's my rookie year. Who, what kind made, of doctor was that? Dr. Dre? Dr. Doolittle? What the hell is he it, talking about? Yeah, man, I, I don't want to say his name because I don't want to go there. But uh, mind you, you know, at the time I was just like, I just started my career. This is it's done, you know. So I, I went and I saw... Uh, a doctor in uh, New York, uh, Mrs. Scott. And luckily for me, Will Scott and Kelly Scott, we were, you know, very close. They played uh, AU and went to my high school. And uh, Dr. Scott was the doctor for the Knicks at the time. And Mrs. Scott was the doctor for the Liberty. And they used to work in a hospital in New York. Mm -hmm. So I went and saw her and she's like, look, we could do the surgery, but this is going to be serious. You're going to be out for a while. And I remember getting a cast from my fingers all the way to my shoulders. And I was like this for 13, yeah, 13 weeks like this, right? Then I came out of it and I had to rehab for another month. And then when I came back, I really couldn't, I couldn't shoot the ball. And I remember I started my rehab with a fork. I couldn't lift the fork. And it's crazy, but I remember coming back and I was one of the best mid-range shooters in the league. And the only reason for it that I became a shooter uh, and consistent mid-range shooter is because of my rehab. I was taking thousands and thousands of shots every day just to get strength of my wrist close to the rim. You know, I was just close to the rim. And it's crazy, but if you look back at the stats, there's a year, I think it was my fourth year in Chicago where I averaged almost 19. And the whole year, the whole year, I made one three and I took eight threes and I played all 82 games. So you were just no Jay Simpson out there, huh? No, I was making jump shot, but it was all mid range. I wasn't shooting no threes, but teams didn't catch up to it. I, I just wasn't, I wouldn't shoot outside the arc. And it really, when I look back, it changed my whole game and my whole career 
And, you know, my message is obviously I always try to turn the negative into positive. But, you know, you don't want to get injured and you don't want to go through some stuff, but you have to find a way of using that time to turn it into something else. It, it, it honestly was a gift when I look back on my career because I was never, ever going to focus that much on my jump shot, you know, because when I came in the league, I was just outrunning everyone. I was getting to the rim. I was driving every opportunity I got. And it changed my whole game. And it's, when I look back, it's a blessing, um, you know. And that's just my way of turning, you know, setbacks and injuries into other things, just to answer that question. But I know for you, Pops, you, you, you had to deal with a lot of injuries, mm -hmm. you know, especially knee injuries. Man that's, man, that's crazy, man. A lot of people don't believe this, but over the course of my career, I had 11 surgeries. I had about five or six knee Elbow, shoulder, eye, nose. Elbow, shoulder, eye, nose. So that's 10 and 11. Y'all do the math. So, um, yeah, man, it was – it's crazy because injuries for me started early. When I uh, – my senior year in high school, I'm running track and playing basketball and thinking I'm going to go to a school that's going to allow me to, to do both. But I ended up having surgery um, my senior year, going into – my senior year and when they told me that you know I should probably focus on basketball that's when I was like it was a, it was easier for me to accept that because it was the first time I had ever had surgery I didn't know what was going on so uh I had the surgery and I just remember like man I'm just starting to grow into myself my, my body and understand um you know start to get a grasp of this game and start to you know come into my own and now I gotta have surgery and playing this knee brace and I just remember thinking it's going to be too difficult to come back and play. And that it was over. I'm not going to go to college. I'm not going to go play after college or whatever. I'm just going to, you know, have this surgery and that's it. And I remember wanted, going through my rehab process, not being able to bend my leg, just like you, and wanting to quit. And I remember sitting there um, thinking about, how far I had come in just a short time and the opportunities that were on the table and just told myself it'd be easier for me to keep going than it would be to quit. Quitting is not in my vocabulary or in my, in, or even in my, in my mindset. I never even thought like that. And, you know, when it, when it comes to every time I had surgery, I always tried to, I always looked at this, I was looking at the ceiling and wonder if I was ever going to play basketball again. My only saving grace was the fact that I had a degree and knew that I had made, I had a network and relationships that were going to put me in a position whenever the, the ball stopped bouncing for me, that I could uh, do something. But speaking of injuries, I'm trying to think of one that stood out because, as you can see, I had so many. I would say my, in 2011, the year before we went to the Olympics, um, I remember I'm having one of my best seasons, leading the league and scoring and rebounding in France. And, you know, every time I played well, it's the first situation I've been in where if you play well, you, um, like, if, as an individual, when I played well, the team would win. So I knew that the, the team's success was predicated on, on how I played. And I remember just coming to practice early, working out before practice. I used to do 500 push-ups a night just to, to be in shape and just to stay ready. And I remember I, I, I jumped out for a pick and roll and my man slipped the pick and roll and went to the basket. And the help side, who well, I'm not going to mention because he didn't help, uh, <laughs> missed his assignment. And I, I, I'm me thinking, making an extra play, I, I run past him and go to block the dunk. It's Aminu's brother. Um, Aladi, Aladi Amina's brother who plays for Nigeria. He um he goes to dunk it. I'm like, look, it's either go hard or go home. Because if you don't get through this, you're gonna get dunked on. And I remember blocking his dunk, but the force of him trying to dunk it and me trying to block it made my whole shoulder come out. So um my shoulder was right here. And I remember just it's on my page somewhere. I remember just lying there on the floor looking at my shoulder and I'm like, man, this can't be good. And the trainer comes over to me and I told him, hey, I think my shoulder's out, put it back in. And he's like, what? 
and I'm like, man, you got to put my shoulder back in. Like, like I can't just lay here like this. And he like he gets hesitant. So I'm like, help me up. He, he helps me up just like this. And I remember grabbing both my hands and just pulling. And my shoulder popped back in. So I'm thinking, all right, cool. You know, this the Ashanti in me. I'm like, ain't, ain't nothing heavy. I'll be back. So I go and, I, and they take me out of the game because obviously they have to stop play. I go to the coach like I'm ready. And the doctor was like, whoa, 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 you're not ready. Your whole shoulder just came out. Let's do some tests first. So he's like, pick your pick your hands up. And I go like this. He said, pick both your hands up. And I do this again. And um, he's like, why are you not picking the other hand up? I was like, because the message is not being sent. I can't pick this hand up. It's not working. And turns out I tore every ligament and um, – every ligament in, in, in my shoulder, my labrum and my rotator cuff. Mind you, the Olympics are eight months away. Oh, uh, let's say 10 months away. And I just tear, tear my shoulder. And the doctor tells me with surgery, I'm going to be out six months. I'm like, man, he said, but if you don't do the surgery, there's a 30% chance it could happen again. So here I am injured again, trying to figure out what I'm going to do next. And I just, I was like, you know what, I'll have the surgery. And I remember staying, moving to Florida to go have the surgery and to rehab. And I did it every day, twice a day for like four or five months. I, I healed in like four months. And the doctor couldn't believe it. But I healed in four months because I knew this opportunity that I was about to have in a year, I would never get again. To play in the Olympics in my own backyard, 15 minutes from where I grew up, was never going to happen. So I just remember using that as motivation to get back on the court. And, you know, that's probably one of the, the most glaring um, injury stories for me that, that stands out. Mm -hmm. All right, let's take, should we take a couple more questions? What, what, uh, yeah, man, else? we can, we can take a few. Um, what we Don't, got? Listen, Kieran, no more questions from Kieran. We don't, we don't want to hear about Pops. I'm going to block him. I'm going to block him. I'm going to yeah. block Kieran. And I'm going to report him to Instagram, too. Yeah, we can't be hearing the stories of, uh, you know, people picking on Pops. Yeah, man. Yeah. So let yeah. me see what other sto uh, questions are here that we should take. I missed a few questions when we were speaking, some good ones. So I know. So I so Benson and Benny got some here. So um, what advice do you, do you have for African kids wanting to make it to the NBA from Seth Peters? You want to take that or you want me to take that? You got it first. I just finished talking. I think, you know, um, to me, the biggest thing, um, and, and it's changing now, um, and I'm going to relate it a little bit to a story that, you know, I had something I had to do, which a lot of people don't know. Uh, my first All-Star, um, my first All-Star year, I was so motivated to make All-Star. Uh, and it was because at that time, there was a lot I was going back with Amadou. We were doing camps uh, in Africa, trying to, you know, develop the game. And at the time, me and Amadou were just going to any place we could think of, uh, just getting basketballs and going out there and doing clinics and picking kids through the federation or whatever country we go to. And I remember just being upset and motivated at the same time uh, by the love that I was getting from, you know, the kids in Africa. And I remember the NBA, which, you know, uh, it's, it's great what they do around the world, but I felt that there was, you know, Africa was kind of being ignored. Um, and I felt like more can be done uh, in Africa. And I, and I wanted, I was just thinking of a way, how do I just get attention there? And I remember uh, when I made the All-Star team, um, you know, I just I just couldn't believe it that I finally made it. I, I had a few years before that where I felt that I should have been, but I didn't make it. Mm -hmm. uh, and this time, finally, I was going to be an all-star. And this was my first year. And I decided that I remember going to all my teammates at the all-star game before anything happened. And I said, look, um, when they call my name, I'm going to take off my warm-up. And I have, you know, a T-shirt with the Africa uh, map on my chest. And I need to do it. I just don't want you to feel, you know, some type of way. It's not disrespecting the game or anything. But my goal is to just put Africa out there and get the message. 
Um, and I remember I said, I, I told people at the All-Star, when you say, you know, uh, the war dang, Chicago Bulls, I wanted, I wanted them to say from South Sudan. And I remember going up there and, you know, after I told my coaches, I was so nervous. Uh, I was about to do something we were told in the locker room not to do. Uh, we were told don't, you know, wear anything that has nothing to do with the sponsors and NBA. So when I got up there and they called my name, I just took off my warm up and I remember holding the t-shirt, you know? And, and what's so crazy was I was nervous, man. I, I was just no ner nervous of what the outcome will be. But afterward, I was so happy of just, you know, everyone talking about it and everyone being proud and the game was live in Africa. So my, my, my message to, to kids is, you know, you, you start to realize the, the talent, you know, so many kids, we, we're so blessed to have the opportunity, but so many kids have the talent. And a lot of time what's missing is support and belief. Um, and this happens, you know, around the world. Obviously, we're talking about Africa right now, but it's, it's you know, working, working as hard as you can with what you got. Um, the opportunity will come. And we, we have to do our best on this side to create more opportunities. But as we're working to do more and there's more now, that's why you see more NBA players from Africa. But as we're working to, to bring more opportunities, you, you have to be ready in terms of when we show up that you're ready. Um, you know, it's not, it's not just waiting for us until the opportunity comes and then try to turn it on. You got to work out every day thinking that no matter what, with what you got, you're going to make the best out of it. And as you travel across Africa, you realize, you know, everyone has it differently. There's, there's different, you know, scenarios across the world. But in Africa, you see some kids, you know, they don't have what other kids have in certain regions. You see some, some places they have sports, some places don't. Some places they have, you know, uh, better coaching, but they don't have the facilities. And, and it's our job to kind of recognize that and bring it along. But just, just keep working on your game and, and keep trying to learn as much as you can. And now... Kids, you know, I get, I get messages from kids that are in villages in Africa, and that never happened before. You know, before even me growing up, I only knew about the players that we could only get our hands on. Basketball wasn't on TV like that. You know, now you could get it on your phone. Uh, so it's definitely different. So my message is just keep working and keep pushing and take, you know, take the opportunities that you got to, to the fullest. Man, that's crazy, man. And, you know, speaking to that, I remember – when uh funny story my brother had a teammate in college who's from um central from drc and whenever the kembe would um whenever the kembe would would play or get ready to play an nba game his dad would stand up and sing the national anthem because he was from the same country and i remember i was in this was gosh what year were you all-star the first time Bloody hell. Um, Yo, um, I think it was 2011, 12. Or okay. 12, I was in France. No, I don't, yeah, I think so. I'm not sure, you know. Right. So it was either way, I was in France. Or I think, I know it was in Russia. It was 2010. It was in, I was in Russia, I remember. So yeah, I was in 2010? Russia. 2010, yeah, the first time. Yeah, and I remember seeing you get you go up there and they call your name. I'm excited. And I remember you lifting the shirt and doing this. Bro, if that's the closest I've, I've I've come to crying watching the basketball game. Of it. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I was I was in there by myself, yelling and screaming like, <laughs> man, go to the man because it was a big moment not only for a personal friend but it was also big for for Africa, yeah. and it just made everybody because you know for me growing up, uh, we know we spoke about this earlier. You go up so so much. You go up trying to be the same as everybody else. You just grow up trying to fit in and you're the young African kid who who just stands out and you can't help it. Now you come full circle and you embrace your culture, you embrace who you are and where you're from that you can boast it on the bigger stage. And then when I see you do that, it, it really dawned on me like, man, you got to become more comfortable um, comfortable with who you are. As as African, and that's and that's and that's that moment right there did it for me, and that yeah. was a big moment, man. Definitely, congrats on that one. Um, let's see what else we got. Oh, I love this question, kid. 
uh, the Ashanti, he says, did being from Africa add to your survival in the NBA? Oh, oh period. Yeah, I think, uh, not, I think, yeah, everyone is different, man. I think your experience matter uh, to your mindset. I think, you know, having, having a bigger goal than just you helps a lot. I think also dealing with uh, certain things that a lot of people didn't look at as a blessing, uh, you know, came as a blessing to, to me or, you know, people with similar backgrounds. So it definitely a lot. Uh, upbringing obviously has a lot to do with it. Um, you know, I think everyone, I think most successful people are trying to accomplish your goal a lot of times how you deal with things or how your mind process things matter. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it definitely helped a lot. Uh, there's, there's a lot of situation where uh, I was just happy with what I had and what I got. And a lot of people looked at it as, you know, they wanted more. Um, even being an NBA, I could speak about a lot of teammates that I've had that didn't really take the opportunity with what they were given because they thought they, they deserved more. And, mm -hmm. you know, even with college and high school, you know, I just, I mean, I remember, I remember being uh, in Chicago one summer. Uh, I did it a few summer, but I remember I took exactly the same thing, the same approach that I had in high school, the same approach that I had in the NBA. Uh, and this time when I got to the NBA, I realized that I didn't have to take classes. Uh, you know, all day my job was just to play basketball. And if you talk to anyone in Chicago, I used to pretty much live uh, in the practice facility at the Birdo Center. Um, I used to get up in the morning. I used to take naps at the practice facility. I used to shoot in the morning, work out, take naps, wake up, take naps, have my dinner, and then I would drive back uh, around 8 o'clock or 9 and go to sleep and repeat all summer. Um, and it was because I wanted it so bad. Uh, I don't think people understand, like, how bad I wanted it. But I always felt like, you know, it can be better than this. And also, so it definitely, my background, you know, even even when we talk later, I know we're going to talk about a lot of other things. But even when we talk about, you know, life after playing and business, going into business and, you know, the things that we're doing now and trying to bring basketball uh, to the continent and all that, I think a lot of it has to do with the background and, you know, and what we've experienced. But it definitely played a big role for me. What about you? Man, I, it's, it's what defines me. I think uh, our heritage and our culture and who we are is what defines me, like our name, like, which is why I was proud that, you know, when you finally went back to um, – to the wild and wasn't going by Michael and I wasn't going by Dwayne. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's acceptance of, of the culture. And Yo, who, who fits, uh, not to cut you off, but do, do I fit Michael better or do you fit Dwayne better? <laughs> well, the, well, actually, the masses actually called you Michael. Only a few people would call me Dwayne. Nah, nah, and nobody Dwayne, ever knew that I, Dwayne I story. I can't see you being Dwayne, bro. I can't. Right. That's what I'm saying. It didn't last long. But that's that was me, tr like, just pulling that pulling that something to try and make to fit in, and obviously it didn't work. But for me, you know, being from from Ghana and uh, the Ashanti tribe, I always felt like there's no room to to fail, and there's no room. Michael Clark Duncan. There's no um, that that mindset that that can't even that thought can't even go in my mindset. And um, like anytime something negative happened or obstacle ran in, I always would refer to my heritage and my name. And when I found out the meaning of my name and found out, um, you know, how, you know, what's funny, the name uh, Dwayne or Dwayne or Dwayne in Ghana, there's only a few people who have that name. And when I realized that, I realized I was doing myself, my culture and my family a disservice by not... Um, um, owning and embracing that. And so, again, I, I was joking about it earlier when I said, what's up, Will? When I said I got jumped. But the Ashanti in me is is who you see on the court. Me yelling and screaming and being emotional and, and wanting to tear the rim off. Like, I, I like to think that was my African culture. That continent, our continent has been through so much. Our, um, you know, it's it's been depleted of all the resources for so many, for hundreds of years. 
And I remember you said it best, man. It was, man, I like you not. Just the twice, two times you almost made me uh, shed a tear. When we was in uh, Johannesburg and you was talking about for the longest, um, Africa has always, has, has always been about what it needs. Now it's time to show what Africa has. So now when I walk around, you see an African. Yes, I was born and raised in London, and I definitely um, embrace that, and I definitely have my roots in London. But my culture, my heritage, and who I am is an Ashanti man from, from Ghana, and, I, and I've always embraced that and always hung my hat on that and always been somebody who... Um, it's, it's a joke when people... Just, what did you say to me when we, we got on the call earlier, when, when we was like, where were you? What were you doing earlier oh, today when we talked? I was getting my pops on, you know what I mean? Right. You were getting my pops on. I was, I was out there working out. I was in, you know what I mean? Listen, right. I ain't coming out of this quarantine chubby, you know? <laughs> coming out right. Right, right. But I, I say all that to say because that was what I hung my hat on. I hung my hat on the work and I hung my hat and, and being strong and physically, mentally, and emotionally strong because everything Africa has been through, everything our people have been through, is nothing compared to the struggles that we, I mean, what we go through is nothing compared to the struggles that our ancestors had to go through. So waking up at 5 a.m. to go work out or taking naps to the gym and spending the whole day, day in the gym is minuscule compared to what uh, the people before us came. So I always would say, well, Kwame and Kuma went through so much more and all these other people had to struggle and endure all of this. I can endure this working at waking up at 5 a.m. and driving an hour to work out. That's nothing to me. So, yes, I definitely use my heritage as a, a, a and attest my heritage and my culture to my survival in the NBA or period. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny you said that with, with what your name means. I remember when I found out, um, I think I think if I'm right, it means a uh, whale killer, right? Okay. Um, no. or, or, am I wrong? Or did you just make that up? I uh, didn't make it up. It, but you gave me, I, I remember you told me that your name is uh, a whale killer. But then do you remember the Africa versus the world game in, in uh, South Africa? Yeah. I still have the picture. You gave me a lamb. So I was like, how are you a whale killer? But you're giving me a chain <laughs> of a lamb, <laughs> of a goat. And I was walking around wearing a goat. And <laughs> was looking at me like, yo, and I was trying to tell him like, yo, you don't know this, this, this is, this is powerful, you know. It like, is. It is. Goat. Yeah, man, it's crazy. An artist gave me um, this huge necklace in South Africa that was from the Ashanti tribe, and with my uncle being the current Ashanti king, I was like, man, I'll pay whatever for that. Like, I need it. And he was when he realized that I was telling the truth about my heritage and my family, he was like here and gave it to me and so i was like man i have to represent and so we went to the game and we were supposed to we were supposed to i was coaching we were supposed to wear t-shirts and i was like man f that i'm i'm going and representing the culture and doing this one for the culture and i remember having a traditional shirt on and having the necklace on and at first everybody was like man what the hell and then yeah what's, what's, what's so the then, meaning by what's the meaning behind the goat it was a ram and oh, India, oh, my bad. I thought, I thought <laughs> a ram and a goat, you know, I guess they're similar. It's yeah. a goat with horns. So um, uh, a ram means, uh, represents authority mm. in the Ashanti tribe. So I was wearing it proudly. And, and um, although, you know, those things are only <laughs> for the king, I was like, on this stage, I think, especially uh, Africa against the world and one of the first um, time all these NBA All-Stars would be on the continent, I definitely felt like it was necessary to um to show that part of our, our culture and our heritage for sure yeah yeah now i got I'm, I'm definitely gonna post that picture i still have that picture i gotta show people yeah man you know how powerful that chain is was it was that chain all gold yeah damn i should have kept it <laughs> <laughs> I, should, I, should, I knew i should yo but speaking about names you know what's so crazy um it took me a while to really you know understand what the name uh, Luol means. And, you know, the funny thing about my name is it depends where you're from, the way you pronounce it. You know, it's just, wow. everyone says it different. In, in, in my language, uh, uh, in South Sudan, my name is Luol, right? And when you say Luol, it's, the name goes back to 
the lower people from Kenya originally came from South Sudan. And there's a region in South Sudan where they used to be at, you know, the Lua. So the name Lua, Lua comes from the Lua tribe. Mm -hmm. So in my family or in the region where we're from, your fourth... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> your, your, <laughs> your, fourth, your fourth son, you name him, you know, it's almost like a gift for remembering that tribe, the Lua tribe. So you don't find a lot of, you know, Lua or Lua, if you would say, or in Chicago, it's Lua. Wow. You know, so it's, it's like, wow. you know, you know, the way I think, yeah, they go the way I think. Yo, you know, I love my people. So you better than me. They just just call me the African. They ain't even call me, they yeah, but the, the funny thing is, they always add that too to my name. You know, if you go to Chicago, I'm not just Luau Ding. I'm I'm the the, the African. I'm not gonna say the middle thing. The African, <laughs> the African guy Luau Ding. You know, what I mean? like yo, but yo, we going on. Um, before before we go off, um, anything you want to cover? I know there's so much to cover, man. But um, just like last time, um, again, we got a bunch of great questions, and we didn't finish the the pro episode. So the next time we're on, we're gonna pick back up where we left off. I think we were right around. Um, we spoke about All Star. Um, I guess we'll we'll move forward into like the middle of your career, moving and. You know, when you got traded to Cleveland, then your experience with the Lakers, we could talk about the G League um, overseas. You know, we spoke about getting traded and waived uh, playoffs for you and then the business of the NBA. So we'll we'll pick that up next time we we'll, um, we talk. Uh, where, where, where are you reading all that stuff? Who said I was reading it? Bro, everyone could see you were reading it. We know your computer, your laptop is right there. <laughs> I'm reading it. You know why I'm reading it? on my laptop oh here we go in a live document that we put together so that my brother and benny and all of us can 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 to keep in contact and talk when we have these questions you so, over here trying to keep them in your head you gotta so, think smart That's so it's it. in a so it's in a live thing the... it's in a live thing what do you think you think i'm memorizing this i'm so I just got laughing at what okay. kieran's saying to be remembering questions no 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 Burnell, no. what up brother you, know, you we, covered it. We you stuff. covered it, man. We can give uh, shout out. All right, go ahead. You do the shout out. Well, um, off top, I see my guy, Kyle Hines, who probably has the greatest career of any American in Europe. Um, shout out to him. Still doing the big over there. Dio, what's up? Kieran Achara. Um, man, Jeff Laub. We went to high school together. I used to ride to, to high school with this guy. Good dude, Blind Barber. Um you know you can throw out a shout out too. You just got me saying what's up to everybody. Oh my bad. I thought I was right just now, giving you time. Oh, I see Nazi. Yo, my guy Nazi. Nazi's he here. Needs a, Nazi needs a whole hour. No, he does. First, you know, first Ghanaian player to play in the NBA. Shout out to Nazi and Muhammad. Listen, Nazi. Hey, Nazi. Nazi put me on Luther. You remember the show with Edris Elba Luther? Yeah. Yeah, yeah Nazi yeah. used to yeah, Nazi used to come in a plane with his coat. With the trench coat. So said, yo, I wanted to be Luther. So me and Nazi used to compete. Like, yo, I'm Luther. Yo. <laughs> Shout out to Nazi, man. Nazi, um, um, who else we got? Uh I see Jay. I see Jay Will. Jay Will. Uh, Brixton's Jay Will was in there. So many people, man. Um, uh, Elijah, you gotta say what up to uh Nazi's brother. My man. Yeah. Nah, Elijah, Elijah was in here last time too. Uh, yeah, 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 he's always he's always uh, supporting. Uh, I remember I called him two days before my camp in Ghana, and he was like, "Say no more." Shout out to him, man. He said, "Say no more." Flew all the way to Ghana in two days and and worked the camp. So yeah, yo, I know brother. I know we're covering a lot um, of basketball for those people that are tuned in. We're gonna cover a lot also about just. Um, Africa in general, uh, this side now, without playing, this side of just being involved with basketball, especially for Pops being, you know, a GM. A lot of people want to know that side, the business side, and not mm -hmm. just the U.S. Uh, for both of us and what we're investing in, but also what we're trying to do in Africa investment-wise. We're also going to talk about basketball and building basketball, uh, not just here for the diaspora and, you know, kids – that just want to make it not just in the UK, but also, you know, uh, back in Africa also. So there's so much to cover. So, you know, this is our fourth episode, which, you know, was the longest episode, but that was really because of the request that we get from everyone. So we're going to try to cover as much as we can. Uh, we might even do five minute segment where we're going to talk about Tottenham 
and use the other 55 minutes to talk about Arsenal. <laughs> but, nah, seriously, uh, I don't know. Shout out to everyone, man. Thanks for the love. Uh, we'll continue this. Um, we'll also take questions in the live doc or the, yeah. So, so if you want to send questions on the next post, we'll, we'll leave a space for you guys to leave your questions. Um, just make sure you hashtag then pops chat talk. I'll... Yo, why everybody blaming me? Fine. Nah, nah, listen, not even, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Bro, something is wrong with my phone, bro. I can't yeah, do it hey, live. Nah. Hey, we're trying to do live on the Nokia. We're trying nah, to do live listen. on a flip phone. <laughs> listen, nah, y'all mess, y'all mess with something in the technology because it's not allowing me to do my own live. Hey, you must come on. For some reason, you did something where they can't hear me, bro. I was on, and something is wrong with the audio. Fam, that's just how it goes. Men from North London run everything. No, nah, I have to test. <laughs> I have to test my own. Something is wrong with my setup. Yeah. I can't do my own live. Hey, Lou is still, he's still on that, that subway flex. So he's trying to go the cheap route. And he's still got an iPhone 4. He's still nah. got an iPhone 4. Actually, and I just got the new iPhone. So I, I ain't going to talk about that one. But no, nah, seriously, something. got it, new, but it's the old model. Yo, but they said, nah, everyone took an opportunity to just go in, though. Like, yo, you're talking to yourself. Uh, <laughs> you know, I see Matthew. Come on, shut up there. Come uh, on, shut up there. Listen, man, anyway, we, we're taking too long. Uh, just, you know, everyone go quarantine yourself. Enjoy, enjoy your time. Uh, we'll be back on, uh, I guess, Pop's got to go to the live. What is it again? The live doc? We're going to figure out a date because we didn't finish this episode. We'll probably find out, find another time to finish this one and then try to keep up with the schedule that we set already. All right, so this time we're leaving for real. So when it cuts off. I ain't yeah. got to come back on with no audio and all that. Say your goodbye. Appreciate everybody. It's love. I, ain't, I don't know how we was able to do two hours, but that's, that's just nothing but a good sign. So definitely happy um, that it's going that route. Um, appreciate everybody for joining. North London, Tottenham is in the building. Yep. Right. Hey, shout out to everyone, man. Go on quarantine. Quarantine mm -hmm. yourself. All right, yo. <laughs> <laughs> all right, yo. All right.